Uh, first of all, I want also to join my welcome to you in this room, uh, on the panel, of course, but also of uh, people, hopefully, who are following us on uh, web streaming. So for them, uh, I recall that we are in uh, Lombardia, in the main office of uh, the region in Minano, who uh, provide us uh, the room. I think we have an excellent panel for different reasons. The first, the gender, 2-2. In fact, we should have been more women, but uh, unfortunately, Maria uh, Giorgio has a car crash on her way to here. I hope sincerely that is only a problem for Fiat and not for uh, the hospital. Uh, we have also a good combination, three uh, representatives from the European Commission and one outsider, uh, Alison, uh, work for intermediary organization and has no her own uh, boss uh, creating a consulting company. I think that the panel is missing two important players. The first, DG Regio, who is the financial sponsor of this interact program, and the representative from DG Growth. Uh, when you read something about them, they promote enterprise. For me, enterprise is the end user of research and innovation, and they are not there. Maybe they are starting to draft a paper about synergies between funding, innovation, because they don't touch with us. Okay, now we go to the core of the business. I will not read long CV, they are bright people, uh, otherwise they would not be there. So I will ask them, in three minutes to tell us what their unit organization they represent are doing, and if any, what is their focus on interregional cooperation? Who wants to start? A volunteer or I? Alison? Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much to the, the conference organizers. Um, I'm delighted to be here today and to share with you um, my thoughts, um, which, as Christian has said, come from um, now, certainly from a, a more private sector dimension. Um, I'm the joint owner of a consultancy <coughs> business based in Brussels um, for the last 10 years, and the areas I work in are regional innovation, cohesion policy, smart specialization, industrial growth. So certainly no stranger to the interregional collaboration dimension. Um, laterally, until last year, I coordinated uh, much work on behalf of Scotland, you can probably tell by the accent, um, <laughs> in relation to some industry-led interregional collaboration work, particularly in the area of the Vanguard Initiative, which I think is known to, to many of you in the room today. So I certainly hope to bring some insights um, from that experience but also to bring that back to the European dimension of how do we make the European system function better um, in that respect. I'm, I'm also a senior advisor to a Brussels-based think tank, the European Policy Centre, in the same areas of cohesion policy, smart specialisation, industrial growth, regional innovation. So exactly the same dimensions. And I've recently joined a brand new organization which is based in Brussels, which is a, a research policy lab, the European Future Innovation Systems Centre. A bit of a mouthful there, but it certainly has very strong ambitions and direction um, for this space as well. So another player within the, the Brussels-based environment. So um, what do I want to, to bring today? I think it's probably a number of um, different perspectives having been on the front line, so to speak, of working with industry, public sector players in trying to mobilize the um, industrial innovation, open innovation agenda using EU policies and certainly bringing the regional dimension to that. Um, how far have we come with this agenda? How much further do we need to go? Um, especially in light of the post-2020 environment and of course, the fact that we had the cohesion um, report published last week. So these are, these are thoughts that I hope to be able to reflect on today and in this session. Thank you. 
Okay, we stay this side, so Anna Maria. So I work for uh, DG Research and Innovation, which is part of the European Commission, and actually in a directorate which is called uh, Open Science, Open Innovation. My unit, which has a very long and uh, difficult title, is called Spreading Excellence and Widening Participation, and actually has two main missions. One is uh, to deal with uh, the synergies between the structural funds and uh, the, 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 the Horizon 2020, which is the current framework program for research and innovation, the European program which of uh, 800 billion euro, uh, which is aimed at strengthening collaboration on research and innovation. And uh, actually, so in this, in this uh, type of, um, uh, in this topic, I mean, we deal uh, with uh, basically, we try to strengthen the research and innovation component in the structural th funds. And how do we do that? We analyze all the operational programs which are submitted by the region and by the member states. We have been analyzing all the smart specialization strategies which have been submitted again at regional and national level. And we try, I mean, to, to emphasize which are the possible synergy, which are the possible interaction be between the structural funds and uh, the current Horizon 2020 program. And actually, I'm here, uh, first of all, to listen, I mean, to your experiences, but also to try to learn in a sort of interactive way how can we improve the synergies? How can we better strengthen this, uh, this, um, this, this, this policy mandate that we have? And um, we have learned from the interim evaluation of Horizon 2020 that synergies are currently being implemented, but in a sort of sketched way. And there's much more can be done in order to improve on the ground, on the field, the synergetic use of funds, but not only that, but also uh, the, the, the strategic and the programming use of synergies. The second part of our work regards, I mean, uh, what is called uh, spreading excellence and widening participation, which is a part of Horizon 2020, which is aimed at strengthening the research and innovation capacities of those regions in Europe which have a lower capacities. And in this current, I mean, program, those are the EU 13 countries, meaning uh, the Eastern European countries, Romania, Poland, Bulgaria, uh, together with Cyprus and Malta, all the countries we joined the European Union in 2004, plus Portugal and Luxembourg. That's uh, enough for my side. Arnaud. Good morning, everybody. So my name is Arnaud Sen. I work in DigiConnect, so I'm more precisely, I would say, focusing on uh, innov innovative uh, and new technologies. Uh, but more specifically in the field of health uh, and aging uh, in my unit. So thank you very much for uh, welcoming me and uh, I'm specifically happy to be, to be here because uh, a few years ago before joining the commission I used to, uh, to be myself a pro uh, project manager uh, in Interreg. Uh, so uh, this is a, a, I'm very keen to, to get closer to our uh, Interreg community because I was also part of this uh, community uh, some, uh, some years ago. Um, just to uh, just to sketch I mean very quickly what we do in uh, DigiConnect, more specifically in our unit. Um, I think this is perfectly in line with uh, with what I would say interact community could, uh, could could expect. We do I mean basically two things. Of course, we support of course projects. So there is a traditional uh, let's say research uh, oriented work, which is basically selecting the best projects. Uh, in our field, so in my, as for my unit, health, uh, health and, uh, and aging. Um, we, we have worked, of course, intensively for many years to, to select the best, uh, I would say, project for the, uh, for the EU citizens and, uh, and for the promoters themselves. But I think we also have been quite successful in steering uh, a specific partnership, which is called the European Innovation Partnership on active and healthy aging, uh, which is uh, what, which was, I mean, in fact, I mean, uh, uh, defined and supported by member states and commission back in uh, some years ago, so back in uh, 2011. Um, to do what? Basically, to organize a structured and a rationalized uh, uh, networking exercise and knowledge exchange exercise in the field of active and healthy aging. 
So we have defined, uh, but I will be a bit more, I would say, specific in a few minutes, defined action groups, uh, which are basically uh, the main uh, challenges we have to face in, our, in all our regions. And uh, Lombardia, I uh, think, uh, has also uh, underlined I mean, the importance of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the, this, uh, this topic. We, I mean, we are, in fact, uh, organizing this uh, knowledge exchange, and now uh, more, than more than 70 regions have joined the partnership. So, of course, uh, I'm f I'm, uh, you can, uh, of course, come back to me as a contact person, but I think this would be, uh, in terms of policy learning, also a very interesting opportunity for regions. Um, what we also do, uh, or at least well, that's what I have done in my position, is to organize uh, and reinforce synergy between this partnership and the research projects that we fund. So basically to select the best possible projects and to make sure that people who need, I would say, the learning from these projects uh, will have an opportunity to get profit from, uh, from these projects. So this is basically uh, uh, our, uh, our objective and, uh, and our mission uh, today and for the next years. Thank you. You are no Nicolas. Okay, um, thank you for having me here. I'm from the Joint Research Centre, also part of the European Commission, but we get to live in Seville rather than Brussels. Um, <laughs> um, I'm in the Territorial Development Unit of the JRC, and part of the activities that we have are the um, Smart Specialization Platform. So everything I do and talk about is done within the context of um, research and innovation strategies for smart specialization. There's also the Lag in Regions project, which looks at specific regions to try and see how they can improve their innovation capacity. And most of my work has been with regard to the Stairways to Excellence project. And this has been very much focused on synergies and looking at EU 13 countries. So we've been going to EU 13 countries liaising with managing authorities, having events within EU 13 countries to try and understand why the innovation gap that's detected between EU 13 and EU 15 exists and to why they cannot utilize the different funding sources to improve this gap and the problem they have with enacting synergies and that there are lots of issues we've detected with regards to synergies. Um, synergies can be very good but synergies also come at different levels. You can have the synergies between the policies, you can have the synergies between the funding instruments you're actually utilizing. And we, we have several issues that we've, well, I'm sure we'll discuss later on with regards to those. The project is then gonna move on more towards, um, away from specific to EU 13, to looking at all EU 28 countries, and it'll be more of a thematic focus. So it's more aligning with some of the other activities within the unit, such as the thematic smart specialization platforms. So these smart specialization platforms take um, regions that have similar priorities under smart specialization and they work together to try and ultimately have some investment projects. And we'll probably talk about that later as well. Um, and for me, it's interesting to be here to very much we sit from the commission side and from the smart specialization platform coming up with ideas and analyzing, but it's often good also to hear from people who are more on the ground and undertaking some of these activities to see the problems they have and how things progress for them. Thank you. Thank you. So I've heard the word synergy several times here around the table, that's good. But in the room, who is taking seriously synergies between AU funding? Hands up, please. So for the people who look to the web uh, video streaming, I saw <laughs> five to ten hands up. No, a bit more. A bit more? Okay. Maybe I look only one side of the room, <laughs> so multiply by two. But that's really the maximum. So who wants to give me about their own work experience a good example of effective synergy between policies to enhance R&D activities. No, Nicola, yeah? I think you are the best placed, but okay. Um, well, good, good examples, the, the examples are different. You can have good examples, but they're not strategic. So it depends how you consider this. We have seen examples, perhaps from the previous programming period, but where people were more or less 
looking for the best source of funding, but really just for the money. So it's, where's the, the, where's the, um, the best way, the best co-funding rate I can get? Let's try and go there. Where's the, the best um, um, competitive rate? How am I more likely to get the actual funding? So, so the success rate, where's the best success rate? And these can be successful, but it doesn't necessarily lead to a, um, undertaking the strategic objective. So we have had examples, and um, there's the Central European Institute of Technology in South Moravia, and this is a good example because they actually had a plan where they took the, the, the structural funds and worked with the, the managing authority. The structural funds were there to, to create the, the infrastructure, and then they had certain aspects that they knew were problems where they decided to get people in. So they used Marie Curie, U European Research Council. They used various tools to get the high-level researchers to come to the institute so they could then themselves attract more people to come. So they actually had a strategy of how they were going to undertake the synergy. But, but I think there are lots of problems with synergies as well. I mean, just running through a few, they're different instruments. If you take Horizon 2020 and ESIF, they have different legal procedures. State aid framework is one of the, these issues where the, the European structural funds, um, ESIF come under the state aid framework and I think Horizon 2020 doesn't. So this can cause problems. There's also different procedures and different timings of calls which can cause problems. Administrative burden, having different procedures, different um, ways of doing things, different cost elements. If you don't have someone within the institution or within the managing authority who can direct the beneficiaries through these, then it can be very problematic and very time consuming. And also there's a maze of funds, which funds to use to, to, to actually undertake the strategic objective that you're trying to do is a problem. And particularly I think in Horizon 2020, if you're trying to use collaborative funding, it's in EU 13, we saw they don't actually have the networks and the international links to, to, to create consortia. So, so there, there are a lot of issues around the synergies as well. So with last weakness is your business. Absolutely. <laughs> Indeed, I think I, I would like to recall that when we talk about synergies, we talk about investment. Investments which should create jobs, which should lead to growth, which should grow, lead to competitiveness. So it's about synergies are about improving the impacts of the investment we do in our region, in our member states. And on this, I would like to mention that recently uh, I went to Kosice in Slovakia, where we organized this wire conference. And we were invited to visit this wonderful uh, facility, research facility, which has been uh, implemented and funded by the structural funds. It's a facility which allows the testing of materials in extreme weather conditions. So from minus 50 to plus 50 degrees. And basically in this uh, sort of laboratory, they try to uh, analyze which are the best materials. So it's about building uh, new materials. Combined with uh, um, renewable energies. And then, I mean, the researchers was very proud to show us all what they had set up. And he was saying, well, you know, after we, we finished this, uh, this infrastructure, I thought that uh, lots of researchers from all over Europe would call me and say, hey, can we come and test your facility? It's so great that you have such an advanced faci facility in Kosice. But then this does, didn't happen. And we are still now in this region, we're in this wonderful, but we don't have international contacts. We are now starting to develop H20, Horizon 2020 project to have collaboration, to build international collaboration so that this facility can be used and can be really the source of new ideas, of new research. So basically, I mean, this, was, this is at project level, this is what, uh, what happens when you don't think about the international dimension of research and innovation in a very early stage. And this is why we need, I mean, the, the managing authority needs to strengthen and to encourage stakeholders to conceive synergies from a very early stage of, of development of the project. And I mean, so what can managing authorities do to, to encourage this type of synergies. I would like to mention the case of North Rhine-Westfalen, I mean, the, the German region, which, for example, is, uh, is uh, basically in giving some incentive to start up and innovative comp companies 
to use uh, research results which have been produced in the framework of the FP7, so the research program, the previous research program, or which are the results of the current Horizon 2020 project. So basically, they invite companies to build on these research results and to submit project proposals which are funded with the structural funds, but, but which build on these results. Or, I mean, the second option is that they will use the results of the project, of the regional project, to apply to international collaboration through Horizon 2020. Well, what do you say? I have two reflections. When there is something wrong in the assessment, if you would be a business angel or venture capital, you do your due diligence, and you would have asked, what are your clients? Where are they? And how do you reach them? The second is the commission. You have huge ton of papers, websites, but not with the pro things that you have done about it. We were discussing with Alison and somebody else in the room, waiting for the registration opening. If some, a citizen in Europe has a rare disease, can he go to DG Research website? helps to find out where is the best hospital in Europe. The alternative is to go to the infantile hospital in Philadelphia for half a million of euro reached by crowdfunding. So we are in 2017, sorry. You pay for things which have high value and nobody, nobody knows about it. Alison. Okay, I'll try to <laughs> I'll try to follow that one. Um, I would I would actually very much support what Christian is saying, but I believe that the and to reflect on the problems which have also been noted by the the two previous commission speakers, I believe that the problem we're facing is rather a systemic one. We do not have an effective pipeline of policy at a strategic level, which helps us to understand not just at an EU level, but at a member state and a regional level, how these different policies and initiatives connect. And as a consequence of that, things happen completely in isolation and in a vacuum. And what we see far too often is the retrofitting of policy alignment, trying to work backwards. Well, why would that fit into that area? How, how do we make these policies fit together because there hasn't been the strategic direction and dimension from the outset, which in fact would be a genuine EU industrial policy. And to add to the contentious issues that, um, that Christian has noted, I do not believe we are on the route to actually generating a genuine EU industrial policy, which would address some of these very issues that we're, that we're talking about. So, the domestic situation is no better. I think that many of you can point to situations in your own regions where you're not focusing on how you actually connect your growth enhancing policy agenda. For example, we often look at the research and innovation system within a, re within a region, but do we really connect all the relevant policies to that research and innovation system? The reform of research and innovation systems in Europe is something that the S3 agenda has sought to address, but there is still a great deal of work to do within that. And until such times as we do, and we can actually share infrastructure and learn much more about what is happening from one region to another, we will continue to have the problems that we're talking about now, which of course means ineffectual policy, and it does actually mean lack of investment or proper investment, which was your point, Anna. <coughs> So well, no, uh, oh, sorry, I know you said that two years ago you would be there. Yes. No, you are here. Mm -hmm. Yes. What, what had made the difference? <laughs> I think what, uh, I mean, what, what makes a difference is that, uh, of course, I'm now in the position, uh, I have, of course, a much, more, uh, much, more, much wider overview of what is done at, uh, uh, I mean, uh, in EU member states, but conversely, I'm also uh, very much aware of what it means to, uh, to steer and to uh, manage projects when you're on the field, when you have to report, when you have to, uh, to send information back to the, uh, to the EU level, and what, when, you need, uh, to, when you need information that is not 
uh, so easy to find. So I think that based on this uh, previous experience, I'm probably in a good position to understand what people need, and that's on this, uh, and I worked on this basis, and bearing in mind, I, I mean, this, uh, this previous, uh, previous experience. Uh, and in that respect, I think that Italy uh, has uh, given a very good example of uh, synergy in terms of knowledge, knowledge exchange between people. Uh, in my field, so in the field of uh, health and health technology, uh, Italian regions have already set up some time ago uh, a, a national network, which is called PROMISE. And PROMISE is a, is a network, so, uh, so it's more specialized, uh, uh, it's specialized in health topics, health and aging topics. But the objective of this, uh, of this uh, small but very efficient national network was to enable people to speak together um, first, of course, at implement uh, at design stage, when they when people have, uh, I would say, the uh, the first idea to initiate a project, but also as time goes on, uh, when people work to uh, for for people to exchange on, on what they do uh, once I would say a project has started. So this kind of uh, national network within each member state. So it sounds sounds a bit strange. I mean, I mean from a, from an EU official, but uh, it's not that strange. Uh, this is, I, I think. Uh, the best way for people to have a very clear view and to save time, to save energy when working on a topic and when considering a pr uh, designing a new project. So this network has, uh, has already acquired I mean, a good level of experience and over the next years we will try to promote this kind of uh, national, I would say, cooperation uh, in close connection with us. So this is something we will try to, to, to promote the best we can uh, over the next years. But I think the synergy uh, is also absolutely crucial when you design a project because based on the experience, of course my own, but of course much, uh, much more generally, uh, based on the analysis uh, we have done regarding the last, uh, I would say, uh, the, the, pre the previous uh, pro programming periods and also our own topic uh, dealing with health and aging as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's clear that you need some kind of intellectual synergy between all people potentially concerned with your topic. So of course the academic world, because uh, you absolutely need a strong and evidence-based uh, input from academic people. And you also need to have a very good, I would say, uh, uh, a very good scientific knowledge of what you do. Uh, you also need, of course, uh, policy makers, uh, people who are host uh, us today, I mean, because they have the decision power. You also need to, to have a clear view of what citizen expects, because uh, in that respect, I think that citizens' association, patient association, uh, are very important also to take on board, because you need to be in close connection with them. And last but not least, uh, private sector. Because uh, in many topics, uh, they, uh, we, you absolutely need some kind of support from private sector, either financial support, of course, but also uh, design support. Because, I mean, private uh, industry, both SMEs and large companies, are also, I would say, in the position to consider and to support you when, uh, uh, to ensure long-term sustainability of what you do. Long-term sustainability in terms of business model, uh, in terms of financial support, and also in terms of uh, flexibility, because it's clear that SME have a very, uh, very interesting to, to, to get on board because they are very flexible. But on the other hand, I would say large companies are also, I think, very uh, can be also very supportive and can ensure this long term, I would say, uh, sustainability. So synergy was underlined I mean, very often this morning, but I think there is a a strong, uh, I would say, uh, a clear reason for that. And, um, and of course, synergy is also what we do in our own position. So as far as I'm concerned, a good part of my time was dedicated to selecting, I would say, the, the best and the, let's say the, the gems of our research project and to come back to, uh, to uh, project managers, to regions, to uh, communities to share this knowledge because this is something which uh, has to be done of also at uh, at our at individual level. Thank you. A question for Nicola. How do you perceive the risk trip sectoral platform to boost joint investment or use infrastructure like Cochise, if if they exist, 
or at the end of the day, you will not really differ from Interact. You will project, just uh, exchange experience, and that's it. Um, you mean the, 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 the thematic platforms, how do they? I think that the thematic platforms have come in really to try and drive it further down towards actual investment projects. So the whole purpose, the whole of, of, um, reason for them is to, to have the um, regions working together with similar smart specialization priorities, to work together, to um, learn from each other, combine complementary strengths, and after defining their thematic area, to map the competencies and matching of business opportunities, um, industrial cooperation and design of, in, of the investment projects, but it is actually not to stop at this, this talk shop, so to speak. It's to actually have joint calls and investment opportunities. Um, and this is where it's different to Interreg Europe, I think. I think Interreg Europe plays a role in it, so none of these things stand alone. So the thematic platforms need, for example, to map competencies and with matching business opportunities, and that's where something such as Interreg Europe can come in and help them devise this. Another point to make is that this idea of moving further towards commercialization has been accepted, and there's um, a call for some pilot studies um, that came out last week or two weeks ago, and some of these are for interregional partnerships. And these interregional partnerships, you can find them on the Smart Specialization website. And there, there's a call for, um, for tender, for, for, for proposals. And these are to set up actions to support commercialization and scaling up of uh, interregional investment projects. So it's to see the investment projects and actually commercialize what comes out of them. And for this, you have to have an existing thematic um, platform. So you already have to have the thematic platform or be willing to create the platform. So I think that the, the whole agenda, policy agenda here, is moving away from just talking to actually trying to find some investments and some projects and towards, more towards the market. Yeah, Mr. Ken, if you speak loud. Hello. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Umberto Pernice, external expert for Region Vasterbotten and coordinating a project, uh, an interact project or series. Just referring to this uh, uh, call, I, I believe this is the pilot uh, uh, interregional innovation project. Right, I was looking at this call because the deadline is very soon at the end of October. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, uh, the question is the following. Uh, first of all, it looks like uh, Mm, it's focused only on a few uh, areas of the smart specialization, specialization strategy, like uh, energy, agriculture, I, can't, I cannot remember the other. And uh, so the question is, would it be possible to have some other uh, pilots like these in other areas in the future? And then, apart from this interesting uh, possibility, which looks like one million per uh, uh, proposal, mm, would it be possible in Horizon 2020 to introduce uh, instruments which will give some uh, higher score, score to consortium that are reusing uh, results from Interreg? These are the two questions that I'd like to pose. Thank you. Um. Well, I'll pass the one about Horizon 2020 down to DG <laughs> Research, I think. But um, on, on the basis of the, the calls you mentioned, um, that's actually more of a DG Regio question, but I've read it as well. And the, the way I see it is they're saying it should be based on the thematic platforms that already exist, which are industrial modernization, agri-food, and energy. But if you are willing to create another thematic platform, then you can also apply for these pilot calls. So, so there is scope to apply for them outside the topics that are already on the thematic platforms. So, so, so it's not just limited to those three topics. There will be coffee break for further discussion, you know, I'm on it. Yeah, yeah, go. On the, on the other part of the question, which was about giving extra points to proposals which 
Currently, of course, uh, this is not possible because these two frameworks are completely separate. You know, that there is the Horizon 22 with its own rule, its own evaluation criteria. But actually, the seal of excellence, of which we will talk later, it's one of these first experience in which a project which is funded, which, which has been positively evaluated in Horizon 2020, can apply later for some structural funds. So, I mean, it's the other way around that you described. So this is currently an experiment, which is a pilot activity, which is currently. So for the future, we don't know yet, because I mean, the future programs will be drafted, uh, will be, are being prepared recently. So we'll see what comes, uh, comes out. Alison, uh, from your past experience of working in the Vanguard Initiative, what is the unique about this experience compared to activities that you have mentioned uh, in the past in Interact Europe or even the RIS3 platform if you have already looked to them? And could that initiative or a similar one be a follow-up of an Interact project? Um, yeah, I think that the, the Vanguard initiative approach model method is something that's now being broadly emulated by the, the smart specialization platforms. Um, it is unique because it's very much self-organizing and in a way it has to be because this kind of entrepreneurial discovery process, which is the, the underpinning um, principle for smart specialization must prevail. Yet you need facilitation support to guide that. And, and what I think we've found over the last three, four years is that the practice is, is in front of the policy. Um, and this makes it very difficult then to understand what is actually the policy implication and how do you generate um, an effective policy pipeline which actually works for everyone. And I think I, I, for that, I would go back to, to Nicola's point about where does interreg fit into that particular process? And I, I think that there is something within that, that that could be achieved because one of the biggest problems within Vanguard and indeed I think with the smart specialization platforms goes back to the problem that, that Christian noted. People can't find each other across Europe. They can barely find each other in their own regions. And we have a huge issue there, which in fact is a market failure because we have information deficiencies. And this is something which Interreg in the auspices of research and innovation could perhaps focus on more perhaps in the next programming period. How do we support the mapping, the matching, the sourcing, the, the finding each other across industry, um, across Europe, which is incredibly complex, incredibly difficult, and also very difficult to get industry engaged in that process because that's the legwork, it's the early work, and it's an opportunity cost for them to become involved because they have business to carry on with. So what, what role can the public sector at the EU level particularly do to drive that whole process and to encourage much greater engagement, involvement and collaboration um, within European projects. I would say as it stands, the Interreg Europe programme probably for me doesn't have enough of an industry orientation and I think that needs to change. I understand the complexities of engaging individual companies. Um, the cluster organization is, is coming together more and I think that that's something that, it, that there's a build, that there's momentum building there, but there's much more needs to be done. How can these cluster entities make much more of an impact on interreg Europe programs? And importantly, how do we make managing authorities listen to that message? For far too long, clusters have seen the European Structural and Investment Funds, even the ERDF, as something they do not touch. They don't even know about it. They don't want to engage with it. And actually, they're often disincentivized to, to come on board with that. We need to change that. But managing authorities will only change it when they're persuaded to do so, when there is a financial incentive for them to do so. So for me, this goes back to some of the systemic issues and I think that Interreg Europe could have a real mobilizing, facilitative role in generating that. Um, in this programming period, yes, and I hope the policy learning platform can push for that, but certainly it's something that could be championed in the next programming period.
Oh, bad luck. Nobody from DG Regio, nobody from DG Grow in this room. <laughs> Uh, another point, uh, quickly, you, you don't need to answer, but you are from Scotland, I see people from Lombardia, Eau de France, uh, Kainu. Would you see in their local newspaper tomorrow to say, we discuss with our friends, but we decide to put the equipment in my region, that's fine for them. But would they say, well, we are from Kainu in Finland, but we, we believe that it's better to be placed in Eau de France. But okay, that's another story. <laughs> to, make the, to make the link between Alison, you with your health platform, you try to do these findings of people, etc. Could you say a little bit more? Yes, I think uh, wh when it comes to, to uh, what we discussed, uh, when it comes to um, synergizing people, um, I think a very important point is to have a very precise view on, I would say, role sharing, task sharing between the different types of institutions you get involved. Academic world, private industry, policy, make, policy makers, and uh, civil society in general. But in, when it comes to private industry, because this is one of the main lessons learned from, uh, from us at DigiConnect level. I mean, DigiConnect has funded, I mean, many projects. Um, that aimed at, I would say, designing something. So designing, for instance, a new, uh, new application, designing a new IT tool <coughs> to support people. So to support, I would say, dependent people, to support uh, patient monitoring, to support coordination uh, between uh, health professionals, families, and, uh, and so on, uh, to support uh, monitoring of outpatients uh, with important health needs. So. In short, to design, some th to design something. And when it comes to designing, I would say, a solution, you need to be very, I would say, precise and cautious when getting on board a private industry in such a way that um, the long term, I would say, sustainability of what you do is ensured. So I think you need to strike the right balance between the flexibility you need when, when I would say, managing your project, because we are in, in fields that are not. I would say traditional fields. So you absolutely need this flexibility when designing your uh, your solution. But at the same time, you need, I would say, also a good connection between this very very much small scale reflection and and design and the large scale uh, large scale potential opportunity to develop, to sell, to market something. So you need to be absolutely clear on that and project that proved to be very successful. I mean, one of them designed what's, uh, what, it, what was called the, uh, a garden angel. So in fact, a very small, uh, a, a very small IT tool uh, designed to uh, monitor people in, uh, uh, with risk of falling. So uh, very old people with risk of, of falling. It proved to be successful because uh, the, uh, they, I mean, the, the project managers were very smart in combining SME design and I would say large-scale uh, marketing. And it did work uh, because, I mean, both partners, both the SME and the large company, worked in very close connection with a very, I would say, clear and honest, I would say, task sharing. One will be more flexible. You cannot ask, I would say, a worldwide large company to be, uh, to be, to, uh, to be flexible 24 hours a day. It's impossible because it's a large, I would say, a company. Because uh, I mean, people working inside will work. Uh, uh, will work. I would say as salaries or wage earners of a large company, but at the same time, you cannot just rely on very small uh, SMEs created uh, created just before the launching of the project because it it is quite dangerous. So you absolutely need to have this ref reflection and project initiative that proves to be successful, where those in which project promoters have invested a, a huge amount of reflection at design stage, so when designing the project, to make sure that, I mean, both levels will be uh, covered properly. Uh, Anna Maria, uh, have you seen managing authorities uh, of the ERDF or ASIF uh, program currently implementing something like the seal of excellence or taking what is the seal of excellence in their region? And if so, do you think they have clear motivation to do so? We spend two words to say what 
what is the Seal of Excellence? The Seal of Excellence is an initiative which was uh, launched by the Commissioner of Research and Innovation, Muedas, and the Commissioner of uh, um, Regional Policy, Kretsu. And basically, uh, it's a certificate which is granted to these companies who have uh, applied to the SME instrument of Horizon 2020. They have had a positive evaluation of their proposal. However, they have not been granted fundings because, I mean, of course, because the call have, have a specific budget and when it's exhausted, I mean, there are a number of proposals which are worth funding, but which do not get funded. So the seal of excellence is awarded to these companies and with this certificate, these companies can go to some uh, managing authority in order to ask for funding through the uh, ERDF, so through the ESIF funding. However, of course, in order that this to happen, the, the managing authorities have to have in place calls which allow this certificate to be a valid uh, instrument for funding. So basically, this Seal of Excellence initiative has a double objective. On one hand, there it's a way to give a second opportunity to this SME who have prepared excellent proposals but have not managed to get through this uh, high competition at European level. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an additional opportunity. On the other hand, I mean, it's a way to give to managing authority the opportunity to use ready-made proposals which have already been evaluated, so a way to cut, I mean, timing and cost of evaluation. Of course, I mean, in, as I said, in order to have the seal funded uh, managing authority have to put in place calls which allow the use of, of the seal of excellence. And we have, uh, we have currently almost 20 uh, uh, seal friendly calls which are um, open or have been just closed or are about to be launched in very different countries. And actually the motivation for uh, setting up such a scheme from the managing authority point of view was, uh, I mean, were different ones. Uh, the Vinova, for example, uh, the Swedish agency, they said that uh, for them it was uh, a wonderful initiative because they wanted to reward the small company who had dared to submit proposal uh, in an international context, in a European context, so who had dared to internationalize. For them, I mean, following up this proposal and try to fund them was uh, um, a, a good opportunity to accompany these companies in their process of internationalization. On the other hand, also, we have this, the, the cases of Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, who so far didn't have uh, schemes to support uh, SMEs at regional or national level. So for them, adopting the methodology which has been developed by the SME instrument, which is a sort of consolidated methodology, not only that, but uh, the, 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 um, the program has already in place an evaluation system with international experts who evaluate the proposal. To have the possibility of benefiting of all this system was a great advantage. And since they had in their operational program, they have specific funds allocated for research, for, for companies to, to support SMEs, innovative SMEs, for them it was a huge, uh, a great opportunity to use this funding scheme which, are, which have a, a framework and they could just you know, jump in and sort of imitate that as a first experience. Again, it helps me to make a transition. Uh, for the capitalization, uh, so 20 calls, 271 needs to region, or maybe a little bit more. That's 10%, less than 10% market share for the moment. So there are, I don't know, indirect capitalization there. Uh, con to continue on cap capitalization, uh, when you scan uh, OPs or whatever, you see that 90% uh, of all the OPs have to support to incubators, to clusters, etc., etc. But not so much for the last step in the journey for research to market, is to find a client. If you are innovative and nobody buy your products, what's, what's the reason to have put billions of euros in research if nobody at the end of the day use it? So I want to make a small survey with the people in the room again. Uh, where they, yes or no, are trying to promote um, pro uh, tools to uh, have a market uh, the commercialization of research research. So, who in this tool is knowing that in his or her region there is a proof of concept scheme? One, two, 
again, less than 10, less than 15 LA up, who work on innovative procurements. One, two, okay. And the last, uh, who uh, works on the demo grants. So aiming that the company can show that its innovation is able to work in a real working environment. Always the same. So uh, eight, 10 people. So small comments for you, or we go slightly to the coffee. Uh, there is a comment over there, if the mic can be there. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Brecht van Laarbergen, coordinator of the Interreg Europe uh, project Smart Pilots. Um, you, uh, Mr. Soblens uh, launched the idea or the question, why do regions not invest in infrastructures in other regions? I think that's a very, very valid question on which we are not elaborating. And now you mentioned uh, innovation and deployment of innovation. I think uh, there's, there's a, a, a mistake in the reasoning that the innovation is not deployed where the research is done. <laughs> so that's a very important yeah. thing you have to keep in mind. So if you help SMEs to um, demonstrate their innovation in an infrastructure in another region, still the SME will do most probably the investment in the region where it originates from. And I think that's very important for, for regions to keep in mind. Help your SMEs accessing existing infrastructures, but it's, it's not the infrastructure on, on its own which is the purpose, it's the innovation uh, which is the purpose. And all managing authorities think the infrastructure is the purpose. Yeah. We have to think about the next phase, the innovation, the deployment. And I'm not even talking about research here, yeah? I'm talking about innovation. Yeah. The next phase after research. So there should be way more uh, effort put in deployment of innovation. Yeah, and if I can add, a uh, lot of SME, if they are innovative, have to be born global. Where is that in your OP or whatever to give incentives to be uh, global? Yes, uh, you can find in OPs uh, some budget to go to a fair, but that's not enough. It's, it's not really demonstrating that it is. I'm conscious about the time. I would have liked to uh, ask a question about how oh, difficult to embed good practice into programming period, but uh, Nicolas made a long, long list, uh, so uh, we have to deal with that. So my last point to, to you uh, on the platform, tomorrow President Juncker of Father Christmas called you, and he said, give me one, not two, one good idea to have a better programming period after 2020. Who wants to show something on the table? Yeah, Alison. Um, the thing that, that I would ask for, um, and I think it echoes some of the comments in the room, is that the EU needs a research and innovation ecosystem without borders. We need something that can generate the innovation that we're talking about. The problem with this is not in the Commission it's in the member states. So I, I would say, Anna Maria, Arnaud, Nicolas, you speak as citizen and not as representative of the yeah. DG. We have an open uh, citizen uh, platform and y you are entering uh, your suggestion. Absolutely, <laughs> I mean, I have a clear idea, which is a single rule book, same rules for all the funding, all the EU funding, being the structural funds, being Horizon 2020, being the, the, the state aid rules, very similar or integrated rules for all, so that it simplifies the, the life of the participants. I, I know that uh, the human resources at the European Commission are trying to make savings. Why not to abolish DG competition? I stated at least that part. Okay, Arno. So my answer would be very simple. Make sure that what you do can be scaled up. Mm -hmm. The slogan for yes. this platform? Because, I mean, this is, uh, this is what, also, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, a critical mass will be absolutely crucial to deliver a true benefit. Benefit for the citizens, for the users, benefit for the patients, if we speak of health, and also benefits for the, for the private sector to create jobs. 
the main reproach uh, I would say addressed to, uh, to, to us, I mean to EU projects in general, is um, of course to, to be, I would say, designed for a short period of time and, uh, and also to have some difficulties to, I would say, to, uh, to go beyond the initial, I would say, core uh, founders uh, of the projects. That's what I also experienced as, a project, as an interreg project manager. So scaling up and critical mass would be, uh, I would say, my, uh, just from the bottom of my heart would be my, my answer. Nicola? Um, for me, it goes back to uh, the procedures and the regulations need to be thought about early on and have some sort of coherence. We're talking about synergies at the moment, but we're talking about them, as we said earlier, after the event has happened. So all the rules and regulations have been created, and then we're trying to squeeze everything together. And uh, particularly in this, I think the state aid framework needs thinking about, I don't know how, but someone was talking about infrastructure earlier. And one of the things we found that when the infrastructure has been funded by structural funds, there's then a problem of use by um, uh, private sector because you have over 20% economic activity, it then comes into state aid rules and there, there's problems then. So, so, so these are some of the factors. There is uh, a question in the room. Oh, not a question. It's a react, I want to react, please. I want to say that uh, it's not issue of rules and regulations. They are important as tools. But we are involved in a number of macro-regional staff in the Baltic, and we all support it. But when it comes to the strategic meetings, it is that, be, that there is real competition between research institutions. You cannot make one unified space if the things are not clear who is competing with who, number one. And there is competition between businesses, so no matter where they are, small businesses and large businesses. And finally, there is competition between and among regions. Uh, we, have, uh, we are also associated partners in one Nordic Council BSR project, and they are, these things are, these are not my op opinions, they are my experiences, but also they are put formally on the table. How to define how we work together. It's not only the rules. It's not only to know the regulations. It's not only goodwill, it's real. I mean, you have huge research infrastructures up in Sweden or in Norway or in Finland. We have very small local markets. Where shall we sell the things? And do we fight with it? It is kind, I mean, we, if we want things to work, they have to be clear and practical. Thanks. There was one and there, and then it's finished, because otherwise the coffee will be cold, and we have uh, uh, Italian coffee is the best, so <laughs> don't spoil it. Thank you. Uh, actually, I would like to start with a, a kind of another wish when you said when San Nicola could ask for, for a thing. Uh, I, I would like to, to ask for one small uh, issue. It's related with state aid and it's related with actually I think that the problem that you, you Christians made us all realize when you mentioned all of those nice concepts of how the support uh, should look like yeah? and, and asked how it is reflected in your OPs and you, you can see that the, there is a big gap between the, the knowledge of how the support should be given and what is in reality yeah? down to earth and regional operational program and I would say that everyone has uh, a big part of uh, uh, you know closing this gap it's very difficult because I know this a little bit more this down to earth a situation from the regional part, but as, as an example, I would like to, to, to say that the state aid regulations are always one step behind the concept of how the, uh, the support to SME should be given. Uh, now they are better than the previous one, but still they are far from the, uh, our current knowledge, how it should be. 
just a small example. Uh, uh, in our region, we are discussing the issue of first-time innovators, actually inspired by, by your paper, uh, in which we have, have realized that in order to uh, convert potentially innovative companies into innovators, we need to give them something as a kind of, of trial that they see that this is something for them. And clearly, it, it's a kind of state aid support which is proactive. means that they don't come to us, we go to them. It's not, you cannot get it into frame of state aid regulation. If you go to the minimis or etc., the company has to apply and show all the paperwork, what they have got so far, etc. You cannot just go and give them small something like of value, I don't know, 2,000 euros, 5,000 euros. It's already state aid should go into the minimis and should go with the paperwork. And, and that's why I would like to ask San Nicola of, of next stage of state aid regulations. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, Ministry of Research and Innovation of Romania. I would very much support the need to reform state aid regulations in order to promote strongly R&D activities in the private sector on one side, but on the other side I wanted to come back to what Mrs. Hunter said about the European ecosystem, innovation ecosystem. I think it's, the, in my view at least, the most important European ideal for uh, increasing competitiveness very rapidly. And uh, here allow me to point uh, two things. On one side, in order to develop such an European innovation ecosystem, we need to make indeed to strengthen synergies between people. And uh, here, not only member states, but in, uh, especially the Commission has a great role by promoting incentives for strengthening scientists' flow from west to east because right now the flows are going from east to west massively. Uh, of course, we have in place twinnings or era chairs or similar things, but they are far from being enough. Much more is needed in order to strengthen flows of scientists from west to east. And then such situations like what you mentioned about Kozice would not happen anymore. We have in Romania uh, two large flagship S3 projects, and one is in ultra high power lasers, and the other one is in um, re research about deltas and seas. And of course, we would like to see that flows of scientists from Europe, from EU15, are coming to the uh, two projects when they are finished. This was just an example. And the second point would be synergies of industries. And uh, here I would come back to some of the points mentioned by Mrs. Hunter, namely to give incentives for the development of transnational clusters. We do much nowadays for strengthening clusters in the region, but it would be quite worth to develop transnational clusters which would use high-level competence from West, but also from East. In many cases, and I'm sure you know many enough, uh, let's say big industries from West prefer to take uh, specialists from Far East um, at global level, yes, instead of taking them from Near East in Eastern Europe, uh, which is a, uh, an extremely valuable pool of um, high-value engineers. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, we will finish. Just to link what you say with what she is doing, uh, just launch a voucher scheme to use infrastructure which has quality and be funded by ERDF. Full stop. Easy, 20,000 euro. Okay. So, uh, I'll say goodbye to the people on the uh, web. Uh, probably we will have better coffee than you in your office, but thank you for having stay with us until now. Uh, Celine, yes, have uh, some uh, housekeeping arrangements to tell us.